Well, hello everyone. I'm Marek Pawłowski, the founder of MEX, and welcome to another of these MEX Live, where I'm delighted that our special guest is going to be Sophia Svantesson, uh, who I'm going to tell you a little bit about in a moment. Uh, now, I'm looking down the list here um, of who's joining this little gathering this afternoon, uh, and I can see it's a pretty even split between some of you who've been involved with the MEX community for um, some time, um, and some of you who I'm delighted are joining a MEX thing for the very first time, which is, is wonderful. Um, so if you are new to MEX, um, then it's probably best described as uh, an initiative. Um, it's uh, an initiative to encourage good user-centered design in digital industry. Um, and I founded back in 2004. Uh, and over the years, we've had conferences, we've had workshops and a dining club where people come together to talk about this kind of stuff and share their stories and uh, share best practice. Um, but obviously we're living in pretty unusual times at the moment. And what we thought we'd try is something a little different uh, and open up the recording sessions that I do for the MEX podcast uh, as the Zoom live events um, so that you guys can get involved and you can meet the guests who come on the show and you can ask them questions yourself. Uh, so this is how it's going to work. We've got about an hour. And once we get Sophia on the line, um, I'm going to start things off by asking her a few questions myself. And then while we're chatting, uh, you can think about what it is you might like to ask her. Uh, and once you've got a question, just type it into the Q&A on Zoom, um, or you can use Zoom's raise a hand feature. Uh, and then that will let me know that you're waiting to ask a question. Uh, I can bring you in on the audio. You can put your question to Sophia directly, and hopefully we'll have enough time to get uh, lots of you involved in that. Um, now, just before I bring Sophia in, um, then I should probably tell you a little bit about um, how uh, she came to be on the show and um, her, uh, her background. Uh, I got to know Sophia back in 2003 um, because of some work that she was doing for Samsung on cultural attitudes to mobile interface design with uh, Ocean Observation this design consultancy that she'd founded in Sweden. And what became clear to me like pretty quickly was that this uh, kind of deeply human-centered, thoughtful work that Ocean was doing was something that mobile industry really badly needed at the time. And you've got to remember that this was pre-iPhone, like way before the iPhone, pre-smartphone for most people, in fact. Uh, but Ocean was out there thinking about how these devices could play a bigger role in people's lives than just the talk and the text that we've been used to, and to do so in a way that represented good design. Um, but aside from founding Ocean Observations back then, uh, as one of these real sort of early masters of the user-centered approach to mobile back in the, the early 2000s, uh, Sophia has also served on the Committee for Digitization for the Swedish government. Um, she was selected by the EU Commission uh, to be a role model for young women in technology. And she has served on the board of the RISE Interactive Institute in Stockholm. Now, when I last spoke to Sophia uh, on the MEX podcast, it was back in June 2018. And you can hear that episode in number 48 of Design Talk if you want to go back and, and have a listen. Um, and she was in the early stages then of this new venture, Elsa Science, which is a healthcare startup that we're going to try and talk about mainly um, in, in this session. Uh, and the goal with Elsa is to help patients with long term chronic conditions, particularly rheumatic conditions initially, uh, to better manage their own health in partnership with their doctors. Now, what's particularly interesting about this for me, um, apart from the potential that this obviously has to improve well-being for a really large number of people around the world is that Elsa actually began life as a client project within Sophia's design consultancy, within Ocean Observations. So she's been on this journey, which I think is 
kind of a bit of a wish list item for, for many designers. Perhaps this is something um, familiar to, to some of you on this Zoom with us to spin off a product company of your own from a consultancy and build it into a separate business. So anyway, that's enough for me. Let us cross now to Sophia. Um, I'm going to start off by asking her some questions myself, um, but do please type your own into the Q&A as you think of them uh, or use that, that raise hand feature on Zoom um, to let me know you're waiting and I will try to bring you in uh, as soon as I can. So let's see if we can dial Sophia in and see how that goes. Sophia, welcome to the Thank show. You. Thank you, I think it worked, right? So I just described your journey there into the founding of Elsa Science as a bit of a dream for a lot of designers. Has it always felt like a dream while you've been doing it? Definitely. I mean, it's um, usually it's a good dream. Uh, but as many people know who's running their own companies and are starting new ones, it's also quite difficult from time to time. But I think, I mean, I've been present in ocean observations for almost 20 years and quite a few times during that journey me and uh, my colleagues have had ideas on products that we wanted to develop and, and, um, and uh, you know, put in the market. And we tried a couple of times within hardware, which is really, really hard. And, and that never happened. But uh, eventually, I think Elsa was the right thing to, to actually pursue this dream with. And uh, yeah, it's been working fine so far. Um, so let's uh, let's move on, Sophia, and um, talk a little bit more about um, this wonderful world of designing for healthcare. So um, you know, you and I last spoke in June 2018, and uh, back then, you know, I think you were first starting to get to grips with this as a commercial prospect and building it from there. But obviously, you'd had all of this experience in the world of mobile UX before. Yeah, how much of that? has been directly useful yeah how much have you been able to transpose directly from the work you were doing in ocean uh straight into what you've been doing with elsa how much of a, a preparation a training was it for you i think the main part of starting to build elsa kind of within ocean as a, as a first as a as a minor client project for for a uh, foundation here in Stockholm and then taking it on as an internal project that we really wanted to keep building on with our own resources has been the learnings about the healthcare system and the patients and the disease that they're going through. Um, you realize fairly quickly that your original ideas around what a product might be or the features and functions, that can change. And it def definitely had changed. The vision is still, the same as it has been, uh, more or less the same as it is, has been for quite you know, many years. But in the end, what you hold in your hand and how it's working and the, uh, the branding, the tone of voice, the features and the functions and the technology, etc., that has definitely changed. And I think that is a good thing because it would have been strange if we uh, were sitting with the same thing today as we did maybe in like 2014 or 2015. Absolutely. Um, and you know, when you made that decision to take it on as a project and build it into a business, um, what was it particularly that prompted that for you in that moment, in that particular moment in time to, to do it then? Because I'm guessing you've had other projects over the mm. course of running the consultancy, which had the potential to become that. But, but why Elsa and why then? Mm. I think... Uh... Uh, when you've been working as a consultant for quite a number of years, and I'm not sure about, you know, uh, who in the audience might have the same experience, but, um, you know, you work for a client and you do not always agree with what is actually being produced in the end. You mean, uh, you might do all these research and you find out about people's needs and behavior, etc. But in the end, your, your client has a different agenda, for example, or... Um, other visions and they go on doing something else or something at least uh, to some extent different and 
you have that feeling over and over again, you know, what if we did it in this way instead? And what if we spent more time on research? What if we just asked a few more questions to find out better about people's needs and behaviors and look at the broader system also, not just look at, you know, one touch point. We, we have to understand maybe a whole pathway within healthcare or education or what have you. Um, and, and you're never really allowed to do that because there is a budget and resources and there is a timeline and, and sometimes things are super stressful and you feel, what if, what if, what if we, we did it in a different way? So I think that feeling has been with me for quite some time as a consultant. And then when I saw the results of this first consultancy project where we had this, you know, we were supposed to transform scientific research into features and functions that people like citizens and patients could use to get a better knowledge around how they can take control of their own situation when they have a certain disease, how information can help them get a better treatment effect and how this research also could actually lower the risk of getting certain diseases. So fantastic scientific research that only the researchers more or less know of. And, and very early, we turned that into a, a prototype uh, that was a tool for people. Um, and I toured a number of conferences and talked about, you know, this is the future. This is how we will democratize scientific research and democratize medicine and let the people uh, get the important knowledge and take control of the situation. Um, and when I spoke about that, uh, more or less at every event, there would be people coming after, afterwards saying, there were patients saying, you know, where is this tool? I would like to use it. And then there were healthcare providers who said, uh, where is this tool? I would really like to have it in the dialogue with my patients so they really understand why they need to try and change their lifestyle habits in order to, you know, get a better effect of their treatment. And then there were pharmaceutical companies who also came to us and say, you know, this is really important to us. What you could provide us with is actually how are our drugs working in the real world? So where is this tool? We would like to be part of the journey. And every time I had to tell them <clears throat> there, there is no service, really, it's a prototype on my computer. It's only on my desktop. And I felt devastated that I had to tell them that every time because the project had been so small from the beginning. So I, I talked to the two professors who were behind this magnificent research that they've been working on for like 20 years or so. It's the largest study in the world on rheumatic diseases. So I, I went to them and I said, you know, we have evidence that what we're doing is really, really useful and meaningful to a lot of different people. And we should really pursue this. And it could never happen within a consultancy. It's, um, you know, a, a consultancy have different requirements and, and could never spend the time it would take to build this into a real product. It takes, it's going to take a team, it's going to take investments, it's going to take a lot of time. So I think we have to start a new company around this whole idea. Um, and they, they are very entrepreneurial, these professors, which I'm very happy for. And they say, yes, let's do it. And of course, the idea was not for them to leave their uh, professors at, uh, you know, their, their, their employment at, at the Karolinski Institute, but rather to be part of this new initiatives and with their knowledge, with their data, opening doors and creating a perfect network for getting in touch with clinicians and patient organizations and pharmaceutical companies, etc. So I think this was about in 2000. 15 when we made that choice and I also realized that you know now I have to leave Ocean in the role that I had at the time and, and now I have to put a lot of effort into setting up this company uh, and uh, uh, doing this with a professor I felt that you know even though I, it, it was it was hard work uh, I had the right support uh, in my in my back so to speak to do this and a funny story, if I may tell you, is that I, I, I realized we needed money and it's going to take a lot of money. So I started to write a pitch deck for the first time in my life. I'd never asked for money in that way before and went to uh, or gone to, to investors. So I, I wrote this pitch deck and then some of you probably know about Hampus Jakobsson, who has been like a famous person also in the Mex community and he's a close friend and I trusted him with you know, his knowledge and background, and I knew that he had become an angel investor, etc. So I sent this pitch deck to him back in 2015 and, you know, asked for his feedback. Um, and then he, he wrote back to me and said, Sophia, this is not a pitch deck. This is a, this is a thesis. This is a dissertation. No one's going to read this. 
Uh, and from there, it has been a, a very interesting and long journey also just learning about, you know, uh, pitching for, for investors and building a startup, which is quite different in, in, in several senses compared to running a, a consultancy. But eventually, yeah, yes, it, it went well, it think. happened. So, yeah. You know, doing that, particularly where you're based in Stockholm, because Ocean obviously was based in Stockholm and Elsa has been based in Stockholm. And, you know, talking there about some of the support that you receive from people like Hampus, um, how much of a difference has it made having that particular community around you in Stockholm to being able to get a venture like this in healthcare with that particular design led focus as well off the ground? Has location played a big role in that for you? Um, I think when it comes to being a healthcare startup in Sweden and not necessarily Stockholm, I think you have a lot of advantages that we have been seen as a country who's been in the forefront when it comes to healthcare in, in, in some senses. And we have had like electronic health records for many, many years, unfortunately for too many years. Here. So they become old and we're still using them. So now we're probably lagging behind a lot of other countries. But the fact that we've been collecting, uh, we've been collecting data on, on patients and we have our social security number. So research has been always been very, very interesting to do to perform research in, in Sweden because you can check up on so many different parameters for, for one and a single person who is part of a research study, etc. Um, so I think the part uh, where Sweden has been uh, looked upon as a, as a fairly advanced country in healthcare, that is one thing, and that we have quite advanced research within the field that I'm working within, uh, rheumatology. It's been one of the most knowledgeable kind of uh, countries in the world when it comes to rheumatology. Uh, and then the design perspective, absolutely. Uh, but I think also it, with, within the startup scene, uh, Unfortunately, I think a lot of people have um, different stakeholders value different things. Maybe I should say it like that. So when you go to the investors, they value technology uh, usually uh, before a lot of other things. They do not really ask for who is your head of design. They ask for who is your CTO. Um, and when you go to your stakeholders, I think uh, like a pharmaceutical company, they're very much interested in the kind of research that you have access to and, and uh, your close connection to patients. And they also know that a lot of Swedes have mobile phones, also in the, uh, also the elderly, and they're very used to using technology and mobile phones and, and you know, browsing their uh, computers and even you know, looking for research on their, on their phones, etc. So I think those aspects has been probably uh, more important uh, to others. Personally, I think that we have a fantastic situation uh, building startups here with the very firm or um, the, the foundation that we have in design thinking and and so on. For, for me, that's been really, really helpful. But I uh, know that it's hard to sell that aspect to uh, some of the investors. They rather look at the, the, the technology perspective. Interesting. That, that actually brings me on to one of the questions that we had in advance, Sophia. Um, we did ask if anyone would like to write in with their questions uh, before we, we started the show. And we had one in from um, Brittany Beckett, who is quite interested in that process about um, how uh, a startup is, is built in this sort of situation. And in particular, you know, what are those sort of building blocks that um, start to, uh, you know, come together? She said, you know, okay, so you've created this, this brilliant startup, uh, but then how do you actually start to get the word out? And how do you identify which are the particular support networks which are going to be most useful to accelerate it, particularly in this area of healthcare? Uh, I lost you for a little bit, Mark, so I just want to mention that and then let me know if I'm not answering the question correctly. Um, but um, from what I heard, so... Oh, so um, did you say you. it was yes. a struggle to, to hear there for a moment? Yes, but I, I think I got the question. But let me know if I uh, if I if I didn't. So um, I would like to thank this um, this uh, person who wrote in with a question to to call Elsa a brilliant startup. I 
I, I think that's a strong word. I hope that she will become brilliant, and that's definitely our vision. But we're very early on the long term. But of course, we think what we're doing is is really really valuable. But it's it's going to be brilliant, definitely. Um, but I think when I also see, I mean, I have a lot of friends. So you you get new friends when you when you start companies because you get a lot of startup friends and you exchange ideas and and problems and solutions etc. with each other and. I think um, in healthcare, it has been so helpful for us that we founded this company together with two, two very, very knowledgeable professors. So one is a professor in rheumatology and the other one is in epidemiology. And they are known globally uh, in their communities. And I think without them and the network that they've had and the doors that they could open for us, I'm not sure that we had been where we are today because it's really, really hard to make yourself heard within healthcare. You need really good connections and a great network because uh, my experience from having, having worked within healthcare since 2011 as a consultant and in the beginning is that, you know, they, they have so much to do. It's a very sometimes stressful environment where people don't have time to eat or go to the bathroom. And then you come as, a, as an outsider and, you know, I would like to have one hour of your time to talk about my projects and, and try to convince you that they can help you in your work, etc. It's really hard to get those moments with the healthcare providers. And, and those have been a really, really important or are a really, really important stakeholder to us, of course. Um, so when we have the professors who are kind of endorsing what we're doing and people know who they are, it's easier for them to open the, and their door and think, okay, we should give Elsa, you know, try, let's listen to them for 30 minutes or 45 during our lunch break or whatever it could be. So I think that has been super important. Um, and then I think have, since I've been in, in the design and technology industry also for quite a lot of years. I, I mentioned Hampus Jakobsson before and I can mention him again. Uh, when I reached out to him, you know, almost now four years ago, he opened up a lot of doors to me immediately uh, since he had been within venture capital and, and already had the startup journey of, of his own, several. And he knew exactly, you know, who I should talk to. It's like, oh, you should talk to this guy and this girl. And, you know, this might be a possible CTO and this could be an advisor to you, etc. And I think the startup network is super helpful uh, in that way. Um, but um, uh, for me, again, it was uh, an, a fairly smooth journey knowing someone like Hampus. And, and, and that has been uh, great uh, for me as well. And then you, you get to a certain level with these networks and with these contacts. And then you're, you, know, you have to start delivering yourself. You have to build a brand and you have to get out there. And, and uh, again, I, I, we've hired some, some fantastic people, of course, here at Dalsa, and also someone who's like great at patient relations. So, so we have one of our employees have the disease that we're working with uh, herself, and she has a great network for patient organizations internationally. So she can reach out and make sure that we can spread our word in patient organizations also outside of Sweden. So another super important person, just like everyone else who works at Elsa, but I think uh, pinpointing uh, needs like that, uh, networks into healthcare, networks into patient organizations, networks into uh, the investors and networks into pharma, if that is your client, for example, it's, it's easy. It's important to find those people who could help you with that. So um, perhaps we could talk a little bit about some of the design elements as well, Sophia. Um, I'm kind of intrigued to know about, uh, you know, some of the particular things that for you, as you've started to approach the design of this service from a digital perspective, have proved challenging for you. Um, I've seen a little bit of the, um, the the work which you've started to produce around this, what it's looking like in its initial form. Um, but what are the parts that you've found hardest, you know, as a designer? Oh, yes. Uh, what's not hard, <laughs> I was going to say. I think when you start digging into healthcare, uh, you realize that uh, healthcare is not rocket science. It's a lot more difficult than that, I think. Healthcare is one of the most difficult things that mankind has invented. It's, it is, to a large extent, very, very complex. And if you if you compare with rocket science, now I'm not a specialist, but I guess it's really hard to 
you know, figure out how gas flows within some kind of rocket engine, nozzle, etc. And those are not easy things. They are very advanced, but so is also the human biology. Uh, and apart from just understanding our human biology, there are so many things going on in healthcare outside of our, our bodies. We have interactions within the healthcare system. We have interactions outside of the healthcare system. Um, and uh, there are a lot of things that matter whether you get a positive outcome and a positive result from something happening in healthcare or not. It could be whether you have a family member or not who is there for you when you get a diagnosis or after a surgery. And um, your surroundings, your um, environment, uh, your cognitive ability, your ability to understand and follow instructions and uh, your ability to, to be compliant, for example. Uh, there are so many things that affect the experience of healthcare. So when you go in there and try to design uh, around these experiences, you realize how extremely hard it is. Um, uh, but it's also fun because when you do get a few things right, you get a lot of uh, uh, people are very grateful and, and they also like to tell you so. So I think the design thinking process is really really important in healthcare because it means that you try to op you, you start with a, an open mind with a number of questions where you try to you know figure out what a situation is like you dig deep into a human's uh, uh, needs behavior um, motives interest etc and, and in healthcare also i've experienced that very few people get questions about you know how do you experience either your workplace uh, as a healthcare provider or how do you experience healthcare as a patient? So when you go out and start asking these questions, people get also very relieved and grateful that, you know, wow, someone asked me how I feel. Someone asked me what can be done better. So, so they are grateful for that. Um, and I think that's necessary since this work is so hard and you also meet a lot of um, tragic stories uh, many times and, and um, it's important that you feel that you're doing a, a, a you know a meaningful work, but um, looking at the design process and how you might start with a totally blank paper and you have a number of questions and and you build from that and trying to figure out you know um, not um, I know that uh, maybe I'm going uh, a little bit uh, uh, ahead of you now, Mark, but I know we got this question about. Uh, why we uh, why we go out and ask people you know what they want uh, and we're not really doing yes, that. Yes, um, I, I noticed that come up in the the chat as well. Perhaps mm -hmm. we could um, see whether we can bring uh, Keith Cornell um, in on audio so that he can ask you the question himself. But I think you're right; it, it does sort of relate very much to this idea of who are your stakeholders, how much do you talk to them, how do you use that to inform. So let, let's see if we can um, get Keith to uh, to ask this himself. Um, we will bring him in now. Keith, are you there? I am. Thank you very much. Can you hear me clearly? We can hear you just fine. Excellent. So my question is, as you think about user experience, user design, how much do you ascribe to the Stephen Jobs nobody really knows what they need until you give it to them properly versus how much do you go out and talk to the patients, the doctors, the pharmaceutical companies, uh, the, the healthcare staff, et cetera, as you think about building this, uh, this company? No, thanks Keith for the question. And it's a, it's a very interesting question. And I think, um, a lot of people have stated that you know Steve Jobs never went out and asked people what they want. Uh, he just built it, and and he you know and, and people liked it when they got it in their hands. Not every entrepreneur is so fortunate though to build the right thing either from from scratch. But I think the way I interpret Steve and what he said when he said that you know we do not go out and ask people what they want is that. As a designer, we do not, we neither go out and ask people what they want, uh, but we do try to figure out what their needs are. Uh, so when you meet with the people that you want to design for, you, I mean, it, apparently you have found out that there are problems to begin with, and then you need to figure out, you know, how do we solve these problems uh, by, by uh, understanding people a lot better. So 
when we when we talk to patients, for example, we can ask them to tell us everything about you know uh, their experiences around you know getting a diagnosis, or even you know when did you get your first symptoms? How did you behave? What kind of information did you find, or what did you lack? You know, who did you turn to? What uh, who did you talk to? How did you end up? How did you end up in primary care? How did you experience that? What questions did you get? And you know, how did you feel about the the, the results from from the doctor and so on? And what happened when you got your diagnosis? What were your expectations on living with a chronic disease? And how do you feel about that? And then, you know, everything around uh, what are the new experiences in your, in your work life, for example, having this disease that you didn't have, you know, a few months uh, ago? And what about your family and friends? And uh, how is it to live with taking a drug every day or every other week? or once a month, and is it an injection, or are you taking pills? And when you start asking these questions, and all, always ask why, you know, they give you an answer. Uh, they might say, no, I, I didn't like the answer. I didn't understand the answer I got from my doctor, so I, I, I just left. And, and then you say, but why did you do that? Well, because I felt inferior. I, I felt scared, or I felt that, you know, the. Uh, the doctor had so much power and I, I knew nothing. I had so much little, I had so little power, so I didn't dare to ask more. And then you start realize that, wow, we have to give these people a lot more knowledge. We have to empower them. We have to put them in control with knowledge. So you get these answers to what it is that you need to do. And then transforming that into features and functions in a mobile application. That is not easy and that takes a lot of work and a lot of going back and ask, ask them for feedback. So building your prototypes and going out there and test it and, and figure out what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. And believe me, I mean, I think I go into an interview with a patient and I ask these questions and I, you know, I realize, okay, this is what they need. This is what we need to provide them with, but then getting it right. So everyone in your target group understands the features and functions in the application. What do I need to press on? What happens when I, you know, click on this button? Is there even a button? Should I swipe? Our target group is, uh, main target group is women 70 plus. Should we even do an interface where you can swipe back and forth? Will they understand that? Uh, it is, it's huge. It's it's uh, it's complex, and it takes a lot of time. But I think the design thinking framework is great to hang on to. But you all always have to figure out that you don't might you might not know what the next step is. Uh, you have to be very open minded the whole time, and and you can't have like uh, two specific plans. Uh, but no, you know to some extent what you're supposed to do next, the next month, etc., and the next sprint or what have you. But always be open for the feedback that you get might change things. Um, so we do not go out and ask what people want. Uh, we try to understand their situations uh, in a very uh, profound way by asking them why and why and why they feel and do in certain ways. And then it's our job to analyze that and turn those into features and functions in, for example, a mobile application. I see we also have another question here, Sophia, as well, for those who might not be familiar with Elsa as a, a product. Um, how, how do you describe it? You know, when you're going to some of those um, target users that, as you're describing there, you know, might not be particularly prolific tech users themselves. How do you describe its capabilities and, and why they should um, even consider trying using it, you know, both from, from the end user perspective, but also then from the different healthcare um, providers and stakeholders that you're working with, just to give people a sense of what it is we're, we're talking about you building here. Mm. And, and, you know, this is a great question, Mark, because we are looking into this ourselves a lot right now, trying to figure out, you know, how do we communicate what ALSA is and what is our tone of voice and all of these uh, questions uh, are super important for us right now. So. Uh, I think I might have a different answer, slightly different answer in a number of months, but uh, because we have realized that our target groups are so different from each other. So right now we're targeting people with rheumatic diseases and specifically rheumatoid arthritis. If we wanted to, to get as many users as possible, we would target women 70 plus because that's where the largest group is, but you, you can be diagnosed from you know when you're 20. Um, and then you 
go through different phases. You're, for example, newly diagnosed. You might have a lot of pain and lots of fatigue and a lot of stiffness, etc. And then you might go up and down in these phases. Eventually, you might go into remission, as we say, when you have hardly any symptoms at all. And then all of a sudden, you get into a flare-up and you have a lot more symptoms again. And through, uh, throughout this time, you probably medicate. You're probably on some kind of drug the whole time because a lot of these people never really stop taking drugs. So it's so complex because you have the age groups who are might more or less used to specific uh, interactive elements in a mobile phone. And then they might be in different phases. Some of them might want to follow every little single pain point that they have. They want to measure their pain, their fatigue, their stiffness. In what joint do I have pain right now? And did I take my painkillers? And did I take my prescribed drug, etc.? They're super interested in all of those features and they log everything. But then you have someone who's going into remission and feel that, you know, I rather want help with, you know, my mental well-being or with some physical activity or um, they are to, about to go into a flare-up and all of a sudden they might go into depression. They need help with self-efficacy, with coping strategies, etc. I mean, this is so complex. This is so hard, believe me. So, I mean, we're still figuring these things out. And, and to be honest, Today, Elsa is uh, supporting the people who are fairly newly diagnosed or maybe be into a flare-up where they're very interested in following their pain and their fatigue and how they're taking it, their drug and following um, you know, how they can compare their symptoms and lifestyle habits and their drugs in different types of diagrams. Uh, that has been, it's not, it hasn't been easy to get that right, but that's the first thing that we kind of have managed. Now we have a much, much harder uh, effort and, and target or, or problem to solve with, you know, how do you support people uh, with self-efficacy, with coping strategies, and, and uh, how are you a valuable companion to someone who actually feels quite good? And I don't want to think about that I have a disease. I need to take my drug every other day or week or so, but I don't want to be reminded of the fact that I have a disease, but I want to measure or get help with taking, uh, taking my drug. And then you need a different type of approach to those people. So this is what we are trying to figure out now. And this is also, it's gonna help us how we talk about this tool. But right now it's very much uh, like a self-monitoring tool, uh, a digital companion. And we are uh, best at targeting the ones who want to measure lots of data right now and are able to follow that up in different types of diagrams. Does that then change the way you hire for building something like this? You know, when you think about building the design team and the design capability that you're creating for Elsa versus what you've done in client projects in other industries with Ocean, have you had to structure it differently to meet that, that different set of expectations that come with it being something to do with health? Um, from the design perspective, I wouldn't say so. I think it's the same type of uh, uh, experiences and uh, capabilities and knowledge, et cetera, in, in both companies. But at Ocean, we have never really worked a lot with building things. We have built front end uh, like websites and so on. But now we are building a platform, uh, we're building an application, we're gonna build other types of services that are interacting with this platform where we collect a lot of data. And so I think the biggest difference is uh, experience and knowledge within data science, for example, within regulatory uh, matters, within pharmaceutical uh, matters, within uh, clinical uh, matters and knowledge. So um, we, um, I, I would say there are new areas where we have to be experts, but we're very grounded in the design uh, kind of uh, area, uh, which is a great thing, um, which I, I think is very, very important. But then the other areas are, are equally important. And, and I think that is the main difference that you need so many different types of experts. Before you were a lot of design experts and maybe you know, behavior psychology and, and, uh, and things like that. And if you want to sell something, you also need people with some business expertise, et cetera. But now it's, so, it's, a, it's a vast area that you have to be able to handle. So a lot more experts in other fields. 
Now, I see we have a, another question here, Sophia, from Pablo Itura in the chat. Um, I'm wondering if Pablo would like to ask this directly to you. Let's see if we can um, get the sound going for that. Pablo, are you there? Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Yes. Awesome. Um, I feel like I'm an expert. This is study you are making, not just from like the research part, but more like the design perspective. Uh, just go and ask the people what this, they need more than what they want, as you said before. Uh, but I was thinking when you say like these target groups you are aiming, uh, do you know how you're going to tackle or how you're going to uh, think in the situation when you move outside of Sweden and you go, for example, to France, Spain, or even Finland? Because I can imagine, as you said before as well, at the beginning, like the people here in Sweden have a different a completely different uh, relationship with technology and with the healthcare system. And I can imagine like if you go to Spain or France or Finland and it's like, can you give me your information about your, uh, about your, um, uh, about yourself and your personal information? I know, for example, in Germany, some people maybe it's going to freak out a little bit. So how do you think you're going to manage uh, that transition just to go to another country or that is something you don't have in mind yet? Thank you, Pablo. That's a great question. And, you know, having me answer these questions, I will eventually think, why am I doing this? Because it's so hard and so difficult. But uh, no, uh, you're right. And um, I think one thing that is, um, I wouldn't call it a good thing because it's not a great thing to have a chronic disease. But what we know is that a chronic disease is fairly similar uh, wherever it occurs in the world. So someone with rheumatoid arthritis in Sweden have similar symptoms and take the similar drugs, etc. as someone in, in China or in Norway or in Brazil, for example. So that's, that's a good thing that we have a few parameters that are known and would be very similar for each country. And then you have, of course, the uh, uh, technology technology savviness among populations in different countries. And then you have the regulatories, you have the healthcare systems themselves. I mean, everyone has different electronic health records. They have different uh, systems and, you know, you have private healthcare, you have public healthcare and all of those things. So yes, I know we have a very long and extremely interesting journey in front of us. But what is great with ALSA is that we have been uh, very lucky to be invited into a number of different research projects. So we are participating in several different uh, major research projects throughout Europe, where we get access to researchers, clinicians and patients in different countries, which means that we, when we go into another country, we start in a fairly secluded and kind of safe context where we have a small group to work with. And then we understand more about, you know, how are people dealing with this disease in in Germany or in the Netherlands or in Spain or in England or Norway, Denmark and so on. And, and then we take it from there. So we try to learn as much as possible within this context, um, within the research projects. And then uh, the next step would be with more resources to scale up in, in those countries. But I mean, the short answer is uh, European funded uh, research projects are, are great for companies like us when we want to try to internationalize what we're doing and getting help with it as well. Okay, well, I hope that um, covered your question, Pablo. Um, we're coming down to the last sort of 10 minutes of our conversation. So if there are others in the audience that have questions of their own, um, do use the raise a hand feature or type it into the chat and we can try to come to you. Uh, but there are also um, a couple more, which I wanted to ask Sophia myself too. I was wondering a little bit, Sophia, about how much of this for you has been, I guess, a challenge of uh, front end design versus getting to grips with some of the advances that are happening on the back end, particularly around the role of things like artificial intelligence and the way you can process data to make it into something meaningful that relates to a user's health for them as individuals. Mm -hmm. you know, has that been a learning curve for you? Do you see potential there in how you can enhance the experience on the back end as well as the front end? Yes, definitely. And this is also uh, one of our major um, tasks and goals for the upcoming year to come up with a proper data 
strategy and and now we're hiring a data scientist etc and then maybe my colleague Pelle, who's our CTO should be here now as well uh, answering these questions with me but no I mean the whole idea about ELSA is to uh, you know as I mentioned before democratize scientific research and uh, uh, if we collect you know large amounts of data ourselves that we also can compare to huge research studies with lots and lots of data that comes from kind of other perspectives. We believe that we can come up with very interest, interesting algorithms in prediction medicine and in different types of prognosis. So we're currently building our first prognosis module within the application that will help a patient who are uh, who, who are just giving a, a, a new treatment or has switched to a new treatment. We can help them figure out whether this is the right treatment for them or not by letting them log their symptoms and when they're taking the drug and compare themselves to some of the largest studies in, in the world on, on these drugs. So uh, it means that they should respond in a certain way in order for this drug to be efficient. So this is one of the first kind of um, uh, data heavy uh, features and functions that we're building. Um, and we believe that with more machine learning uh, capabilities, we can find things in our own data, but also in the research data and come up with all sorts of, of, uh, of predictive uh, features and functions. And, and that is also why we're part of some of these research projects in Europe, because uh, the, the, the whole idea behind some of them is to gather large uh, sets of, of clinical and, and research data and, and find new types of algorithms that could even predict beforehand what drug, for example, a certain patient should, should have based on on genetics and serology and lifestyle factors and environmental factors, etc. So I think in order to be a really smart tool, you need to have a really uh, efficient and smart backend as well. And we have just started to take our first steps uh, within that field. And uh, hopefully in a year, we could have a lot more to, to talk about uh, from that field. But um, I think it, also in terms of behavior psychology and behavior design, you need uh, a smart tool that can look at patterns uh, in um, in a person's just daily logging or weekly logging or monthly logging to come back with advice or the right question or the right comfort sentence or whatever it can be. It's not only about uh, do, making the research data super smart. It's also about just being a very intelligent companion and saying the right things at the right time within the application just based on what people experience and I know that's also super hard but at least we were going to try. So one of the things which I suppose is a bit of an inevitable part of the conversation whenever you're talking about anything that's operating in the world of healthcare is this idea of trust and why a patient trusts a service like this, why clinicians trust a service like this and you know clearly a big part of that i'm guessing is going to be how you behave as a company you know that is part of the user experience in this but are there also things that you're trying on the the, the, the visual design side or the physical design side if you like the tangible design side to try to make this feel like a trusted experience for those end users be they um, patients or be they clinicians so that there's actually a a sense and atmosphere of trust around the service. I mean, I, I think you just mentioned that, but it has a lot to do with how you communicate and what words you're using. And uh, I think yeah, this is also quite complex because anything like you know whether your application is breaking down a lot, whether they have a, it has a lot of bugs, etc., will you know change the way you feel about a, a tool, a brand and an application and whether you trust it or not. So, I mean, the, the, there's one aspect on just making the design and the technology work in general, but also, of course, how you communicate and, and how transparent you are with what you're actually doing with, with the data. I think yeah, there are a lot of companies who might not be super trans, uh, transparent and we try to be as transparent as, as, as we can and, you know, on our homepage talking about, you know, what do we do with your data and, we can't, we, since we are on the GDPR, we can never do anything with any data without asking uh, the user first, etc. And uh, if if we want to use the data, for example, for scientific research, we have to have an ethical approval, and we have to uh, that that you ask for, you know, get from the government for for a project, and then you 
uh, you need to ask anyone who is using your application whether they want to take part in a in a research project, for example, with their data, etc. So there are a lot of different aspects to it, but I think um, the one that anyone will experience and probably care about is, uh, in general, how you communicate um, the the look and feel uh, and uh, the way you if you if you're able to really take the user in their hand and lead them through the application and make them as um, uh, you know, make it as clear as possible with what you're doing and why you think that they should be using this and how it can be helpful. Um, but trust is a complex question, I would say, and there are so many aspects. It's not only about following regu regulations and the rules, but also definitely a lot about the design. If that, if, yeah, if I <laughs> answered your question, Mark, I'm not. Uh, sure, yeah, I think it's a very else. full answer to, as what you say, is, is a very complex issue. You know, I'm not sure there is any necessarily 100% um, right or wrong approach there. Everyone is still finding their way with it. Um, yes. Now, before and, I, I and ask you the last question. Then, yeah, my, my CTO, if he was here, would probably also talk about, you know, uh, black box machine learning versus uh, uh, white box machine learning. And we're definitely into the white box where you actually uh, explain also where possible algorithms are coming from or why they're there and you know how things are working for the ones who are interested so I think that there is a technology expert, uh, aspect as well where you can do be more or less transparent and where we try to be more transparent as well. Um, now before I ask you the, the last question that I had for you Sophia um, just one last shout out to anyone in the attendees and the audience if uh, you'd like to put a question to Sophia we've into the last uh, couple of minutes now so um, do raise your hand now and we will bring you in otherwise um, there is one last thing that I would like to to ask you myself but let's see if anyone else has a question or would like to raise a hand and, and put a question before we finish up here. Okay, I think you must have done such a good job of answering all the others that uh, we've we've covered it off. But uh, one thing that I was curious about, given the times that we're in at the moment, um, how are you thinking about uh, the way the service is going to evolve, given what has happened with the restrictions on movement and the pandemic? Has that influenced your thinking going forward? I. Not really. I mean, in, in one way, if we were in charge of speed in the transformation of healthcare, we would have decided that this should go much faster a long time ago. But knowing the complexity of healthcare, we also know why it doesn't go so fast. But I think at least what we see here in Sweden, I think all over the world really, is that this pandemic has caused a lot of organizations, institutions, uh, what have you, to think uh, faster and, and to some extent also break some rules here and there in order to innovate uh, much, much quicker. So um, it's apparent that digital healthcare is a must for the future because we know, for example, within rheumatology, we know that the number of patients are increasing, the number of rheumatologists are decreasing. So within a couple of years, we will have even less time for the patient. So it, the, the whole area has to be digitalized. And, and I think that goes for a lot of other areas within healthcare as well. So I think uh, for us, and we have known that not based on Corona, but based on lots of other, um, you know, parameters and, and evidence that we've had for, for the last year, just talk to, to, to patients and see how they, to some extent, suffer in a, in a system which is based on insufficient data, insufficient resource, resources, insufficient time, insufficient presence in the healthcare. We've known that for quite some time, and that's why we have founded ELSA. And I think now it's been just more apparent and things can happen faster. And we want to help. We want to be a catalyst that kind of transform healthcare from within and not be seen as a threat that tries to break it from, from the outside. Um, and uh, I, I think and hope that it will go a little bit faster, maybe, or we will have more interesting dialogues now with all the different stakeholders based on how urgent it has been for everyone that things have to change.